So, Scott, um, let's start with uh, with healthcare. We have now seen the Senate is uh, Mitch McConnell has basically punted, um, and uh, this vote will happen, uh, I guess, later in July when they return from a recess. Um, Let's just start with this. I want to get your take on this. I mean, what what does that what does that tell us? Because I and um, uh, you know, this may be not the first time I've said it, just even on this program. But I am still feeling like um, I still remember what happened with the house. It was right. dead. People were celebrating, and then all of a sudden, it just snapped back like uh, Frankenstein's monster and passed. Give me your your take on this. Well, you know, there's no question that could happen. Uh, And I certainly hope people don't uh, look at this and and see that as a reason to take the pressure off. Um, You know, there's still, you know, this is still, there's a very real possibility this could pass. Um, But I do think that there is genuine, you know, that it is, it is certainly much better than it was 48 hours ago. Um, I think that there is a real chance to kill this thing. And I think it's significant for a couple of ways. Uh, First of all, I mean, it shows, I mean, the one thing is that there is no inherent value to delay, (laughs) Uh, you know. The longer it waits, probably the less like it becomes. And it's also crowding other items that McConnell cares about off the agenda. So uh, if this was just sort of kabuki, you know, if Collins and Heller were just pr- pretending to oppose the bill, but we're going to vote anyway, you know, the vote would be happening. So what, what this does at least show is that there is actual conflict within the Republican conference. You know, McConnell doesn't have the votes lined up and he's just, you know, there's going to be a couple of concessions. Now, it's still very possible McConnell can get the votes. You know, I don't disagree with you at all. You know, they may be able to cut a deal over the next two weeks. It may play out the same way as the House. Um, you know, and I think, you know, I, I would be pretty shocked if Heller voted yes, because he's up in 2018. I think he'll get one of the two golden tickets. But, uh, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't shock me if Collins caves, um, you know, and and uh, and they, they're able to get the 50 votes. But, you know, it's certainly not certain. Um, and I think the second most significant thing is that, what may perversely save the Affordable Care Act is that Republicans are just incompetent to do policy, even when it's in their interest. So what I, and I don't know about you, but what I fully expected to happen was the Senate would sort of backload enough of the Medicaid cuts that the CBA score would come in at, you know, 15, 16 million uninsured. And the media would go along and, and not emphasize the number of uninsured. But, you know, well, Senate bill, much more generous, much less right. mean than the House bill. The problem let me, is that they screwed it up. Scott, <laughs> let me just let me just explain what what you what you're saying is that when the uh, Congressional Budget Office scores these bills, they only look at a 10 year horizon. So if you were to say we're going to do 40 uh, percent of the cuts in the first 10 years and then in year 11, we're going to do much bigger cuts. That would not show up in the uh, in the scoring here, and it would uh, sort of uh, rope future. Uh, I mean, obviously, future Congresses can do whatever they want, but it would rope them in. It would make it much uh, steeper hill to climb because, of course, once you cut these taxes, you're going to have to run on in the future, or you're going to have to raise taxes to get this revenue back if you are. Uh, inclined to do so. So, I mean, just to, to make it clear what you were talking about there. Right. And what's amazing is the Senate bill actually did that so that the 22 million uninsured is actually an underestimate because it gets much worse outside of the CB, CBO window. But yet, even with backloading those cuts, they still couldn't get a significantly better number. And you're looking at, you know, and, and our blog has kind of been beating up on Avic Roy today. But if you look at what conservative intele- policy intellectuals seem to be arguing, they generally don't seem to understand that Poor people, you know, somebody making $14,000 a year is not going to buy an insurance policy that requires $6,000 in deductibles. <laughs> and the CBO acknowledged that. Like, nobody's going to buy these plans. Republicans seem genuinely surprised by it. <laughs> like, they don't well, I mean, the that, talking you know, point, and you guys yeah. have been hitting Avic Roy uh, this week, as you said. Avic Roy is a uh, su- supposedly the, the reasonable conservative or the conservative intellectual on, on health care. And he's been out there quite a bit saying, well, 15 million of this number, as if like 7 million losing their health insurance yeah, on yeah, purpose deal, was right. not exactly. that big of a deal. But he's yeah. been saying 15 million voluntarily don't get health insurance because they're no longer subject to a mandate. But you're making the point, which is like, you know, uh, if I, uh, you know, you, you, 
the definition of affordability of insurance, right, is is rather fluid. If I make fifteen thousand dollars a year and my health insurance costs fourteen thousand, then I guess I can afford it, uh, but not if I want to eat or live somewhere. And right. that's the issue, right? Right. And and the Affordable Care Act did have that problem, although ironically much more at sort of the kind of top of the you know more towards the middle class. The the subsidies were actually quite good for people close to the poverty line. But, you know, the obvious way of solving that problem is to make the subsidies more generous, um, as long as they're exchanges. The Republican plan does the exact opposite. So what's amazing about this is that um, not only is it terrible policy, they got a number so close to the health bill that they couldn't sell this bill as the kind of nicer, less mean alternative. You know, even the media is just not going to go along with saying one million fewer cuts. You know, just not. So um, I do think that that is, you know, and again, I'm not saying it's an insurmountable challenge for them. But they basically did lose their best strategy for selling the bill. Um, you know, and the media had kind of been asleep for a week, you know, not really covering the secret bill. But the CBO score sort of gives it a news hook. Um, and so that's, you know, and, and the House had a little more time to play with, you know, so not it. So, you know, now, again, um, you know, there's still, you know, I, I wouldn't, you know, if I had to bet, I would probably bet on them passing something. But I would say it's more like 60-40, whereas earlier in the week I would have said like 90-10. Um, and that's not a trivial thing. Um, you know. Right. And I do well, think that this screw-up does make it less likely. Let me, let me present a couple of theories uh, and get your take on these, because these are floating around out there. There's one theory out there that Mitch McConnell um, was looking to have this thing fail. Now, I guess the fact that he uh, – and, and by that I mean – um, he figured this would be too hard to uh, to pass and then bring through conference. He doesn't want to hang it around the Republicans' neck. It's bad publicity. Just go for a quick no and then move on to tax reform. It seems to me the fact that he would delay the vote sort of cuts against that theory. What, what's your take? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think that I, I will buy a soft version of that, which is that it's more important to McConnell that this get off his plate as soon as possible than that it passes. And I think that there are other issues like judges and, and taxes that he cares more about. So I, I would agree with the soft version, but the hard version that McConnell is setting this up to fail, I, I don't agree with that at all. I, I think McConnell would rather see it pass than not pass. Uh, you know, so I, I, I don't, you know, so I completely agree that this isn't some Machiavellian scheme to torpedo the bill. You know, I, I don't agree with that right. at all. Um, and I think you're right. He wouldn't, you know, if, if he didn't want the thing to pass, this would be coming to a vote Thursday and they'd vote no and it would be the end of it. So, right, and I, you could I go away on vacation for the week and uh, nobody would be talking. By the time you get back, everybody had forgotten about it because everybody, you know, had their barbecues and that's it. Move on to the next thing. Now, let right. me... Yeah. Uh, exactly. Well, and, 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 and here's the, uh, the other thing that is, that, that is clear. There's, there's $300 billion or so in, in uh, so-called deficit reduction, which is about $200 billion more than the House plan. Right. And there's there's also a school of thought out there that is looking at this and saying, OK, now what uh, Mitch McConnell has done uh, is he has uh, isolated the objection. Right. The classic right. sales um, uh, thing. You you figure out what the uh, objection is. What's the obstacle to making this sale? He's now figured that out because every uh, person who may not vote for this has come out with with their objection. Susan Collins, gosh, I could never vote for this because of rural hospitals in Maine. And right. if I'm Mitch McConnell, I'm going, that's where I'm going to spend $10 billion of that $200 billion. And if I'm uh, Rob Portman, I'm out there, Rob Portman's going, God, I can't stand this because this cuts opioids. And I'm Mitch yep. McConnell, I'm thinking, that's where I'm going to spend another $10 billion. Um, when we come back, I want to just get your perspective on this. Are we watching Mitch McConnell simply go through a sales force now that the vote has been postponed on some level? Maybe, uh, you know, he tells his people don't have any town halls during this break. We'll see you in a couple of weeks and I'm going to have some goodies for you. I want to take get your take on that, uh, Scott, when we return also on a couple of uh, decisions or I guess uh, you could call them by the Supreme Court this uh, week which is going to have implications down the road and immediately. We'll be right back. I'm Sam Cedar. This is Ring of Fire Radio.